So do we have this idea? Is this is one way of looking at it. You, you can also look at it at a millisecond to millisecond, like you will, you know, your eye senses, you know, your body is sitting over there, the boat, yeah, and the mind is sitting over there, the sense powers in it, uh, with the mind in it, are connecting to the object. You could look at this several ways. I'm just trying to get you associated to the images and the thing, yeah? Um, but this, this karma of becoming is a very important karma. It's called, a, the, the projecting karma is called penjekile, penjekile, so say penjekile. Penjekile. Yeah. And zogjekile is the, is the finishing, is the finishing karma or the detail, yeah? Zogjekile. Zogjekile. I, what happens after this is that you go into the birth, yeah? What this means is, from one life to another life. But this one karma, one out of the millions or hundreds of thousands of your link number two karmas, your immature karmas, just one of them determines which type of being you are. So it is very important. Something happened to the karma from link number two to become so charged up at link number 10, if that one projecting karma is going to determine the rest of your life. Something has happened to it, and in that sense, it's like an atomic bomb. It's, I mean, an atomic bomb is just uh, a piece of metal with plutonium and stuff in it, and it's not going to kill you unless a trigger goes off. In that sense, it's like this. Link number two is just the plutonium and the metal in the casing, yeah? But something's happened to charge it right up, ready to go off and light the fuse. Because when the fuse get lit, at that moment of death, when you're being set, your consciousness is being separated from this thing, and you have that, oh my God experience, I am not my body. <laughs> yeah. You, at that moment, what do you think happens? What would the mind want to do when it says, oh my God, I'm not my body? Grasp. Yeah. Grasp. Okay. It grasps. Oh. It's, it's the nasties. It's eight and nine that charge up that karma. Link 10. It's eight, also, it's that grasping. It's like being pushed at the cliff. Tell your mama saved you. It's that, I don't want to go. So what does your mind do? It grasps. It grasps, yeah? It wants to stay. It has that grasping to the body. And that propels it, yeah? Yeah, excellent. That's what charges out the plutonium, yeah? Now, it must, and I'll talk about Pabonka Rinpoche's thing. So, Pabonka Rinpoche, uh, there's a book out here called Liberation in the Palm of Your Hands. It's out, it's out there. It's a massive book. Pabonka Rinpoche was one of the greatest Tibetan teachers of last century. Or is it the century before now? Uh, it is last century, you sure? Yeah, he died in 1941. Yeah, so he, he passed away in 1941 and he taught right up to 41. He was born in 1870-something. I can't remember. 75? Yeah. 1878 to 1941. So liberation and power, and this dude uh, was incredible. He walked out of the traditional Tibetan monastic setting, which is go and teach thousands of monks and the rest, and he took this information, put it in lay people's terms, and went to the street. And he had thousands of people following, lay people that had never heard these explanations in this way before. He uh, made it real for human beings in Tibet to listen to Dharma. Not so intellectual, not the 12 of this and the 24 of that and the causation of the blah and meditate, meditate. He made it real. And we're fortunate to have uh, the, the teachers that taught us in, in this center. Uh, Geshe Michael Roach was taught by uh, Kenzo Rinpoche, who was taught by Trijan Rinpoche, 
one of the senior, uh, junior teachers of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who was taught by Pabokha Rinpoche. Yeah, I mean, Kinsa Rinpoche even met Pabokha Rinpoche as a child. So, we're extremely fortunate to have the information passed down, and, and the Tibetans are so detailed about keeping this information, and we're so fortunate for that. Because not only do we have the writing, but we have this, what I'm doing with you today. This notion of get this idea in this way was exactly how Geshe Michael passed it on to the students here. Which, if you met Kenzo Rinpoche, was like he did it to Geshe Michael. And if you read anything about Pabaka Rinpoche, I mean, he was radical about it. Sharing this information so it helps people live their every days. So in his book, he says, um, actually, I'll, let me tell you about the, that karma, the, that last karma. Gishen Michael talks about, uh, Gishen Michael, for those of you who don't know, is, is the dude that uh, taught uh, this lineage of, of, of Tibetan Buddhism to, to me and to the people, and some people here. He um, often talked about his mother dying of cancer as he was learning Tibetan Buddhism. And the conventional doctors, the Western doctors, had said, the, that's it. You know, uh, there's no, no more cure, no more chemo. We can't help you anymore. You're done. And uh, Geshe Michael says to his mum, then come to India, uh, where I'm studying. Come to India. I mean, what you got to do is come and see some non-traditional doctors. So he makes an appointment with the doctor to his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And they're waiting at the, the waiting room, and the doctor comes out, um, and he says, uh, he looks at her, and he says, prescribe her Geshe Kile, I think it's called, which is, um, that there's nothing to do. Prepare her to die. Prepare her to die. Just get her ready. Um, it, like no more prodding, no more doing stuff to this being. And he could see this. I mean, he wasn't some crazy dude. He was like a doctor. Yeah. It's like just get her ready to die. So then they spent some time going to as many lamas and so on, getting her mind prepared for three months or something. You know, she, she died. Why prepared? Why get her mind prepared? We don't do that in the West, right? We treat you like a leper, or we put you in a hospice, yeah? Because the state of mind at link number 10 creates a better or worse likelihood for how you'll be propelled in that JQ, that projecting karma. The state of mind towards the moment of death and at the moment of death, what you've been habituated to and the type of karma that will pop up. Yeah? But let me read you from Prabhanka Rinpoche. He says, I'm going to teach you how to die, how to go the right way and take a good rebirth. And then he goes on to list that there are nine factors in the sutra that he's quoting from. And it should be in the book here. Uh, he says, the first reason why we die is because your life energy ends. He goes, uh, the more important reason is that you have no more good karma to see yourself alive. Uh, and just also uh, to that, you, you are unable to eliminate certain kinds of anxieties or things that bother you, certain habits. Yeah, again, it's karma. Yeah. Well, I have a question because if you have no more karma to see yourself alive, you don't come alive again eventually. In, sorry, in this body. Yeah, in this in this state of being. Good question. Sorry, my misword. Yeah. yeah. Um, no more life to see yourself as keeping going in this form. Yeah. Um, then he says the fourth thing. It's kin. Do you know what kin is? You know? Contributing factors. They say it's the other stuff. Yeah. Uh, the contributing factors that are the vehicle for you to die. And he names them as uh, there's pollution in New York City, right? There's rubber burning, 
and we're all breathing it. And someone says that some of those particles get to a certain part of your lung and then it'll cause you cancer. But then I also breathe the same rubber from the same city and it didn't cause me cancer. So from this point of view, that is a kin. That is a vehicle for karma. Yeah, because it happened to you, it didn't happen to you. So it's not coming from the rubbish. It's not coming from the pollution. Yeah? If we're all breathing the same amount of pollution, then you die from pollution and you don't die from pollution. Or you got cancer from pollution. From this point of view, it says it's not in the pollution. It's your karma. And that just becomes the vehicle for your karma to express itself. Karmic, karmic delivery system. Yeah, the delivery system. Awesome. Um, I want to get to... But then he says, the main thing is that you must have ignorance in that karma. Yeah, which is what you said at the beginning, it all came from ignorance. If you don't have ignorance, there is no way that that karma can project you into a suffering world. If you can see how things truly exist, which is going to do the penalty, and I'm not going to do it tonight. Yeah? If you've heard this, if you can see at that moment, or before that moment, have had an understanding, and you do not have ignorance, attached to those karmas, then none of those karmas that you don't have ignorance with can ever get you a body that will turn to fat, that be in this thing. How do we know that? There are, I mean, there's people that have experienced emptiness directly, that have had a, an experience of emptiness directly, they're called our hearts. They're walking around the planet now. Yeah, they're still living and breathing with you and me. Some people have had that experience and are still here. And they've got a bunch of karmas from two in their karma pocket. Hmm? <laughs> they've got a bunch of immature karma, but it's just not charged up. They're not going to have a birth in a suffering world. They can experience this pen as something incredible. They can be in this room with us having a totally blissful experience as, as some of us are not happy and the dog is not happy. If, if this is blank, then the body is blank, then this room is blank. And we are forced to experience it because of certain kindness. Now, people that have had the, op the got to see the entirety of the spectrum for those 20 minutes and come back and realized the ultimate nature of things, that this is a lie, that it cannot have pettiness from its own side, that this is a lie, the way we think it is, is a lie, that this is only coming from me, that the cancer is a lie from the rubber, that the aging is a lie from its own side. If things are black, and we went through that logic before, then every single experience you have to the tiniest detail from the breath going into your nose and out are karmas right in. Because the way you experience it, the way you, you see it, the way you feel it, the way you hear it, is particular to you, to your recording, your camera recording, yeah? And we went into how to plant karma and the rest. So certain karmas are popping up for us. We have certain habituations. One of them is going to push us to a, have an experience like a present from the dude before, or the being before. Just one of us. And the most horrible thing Babon Parikrishya says, which really depressed me when I read it, honestly. Yeah. He says, seriously, it's, it's horrific. It's, or it could be amazing, it depends, like the pen. He says, even if you've been a perfect practitioner, kept your vows, your morality, etc., 
but you have a single moment of ag anger at that point, too bad. <laughs> Equally, if you've been a bad person, I wish I could use more swear words in class. If you've been a bad person, <laughs> you know, and not really cared, but at the moment of death, the state of mind is such that you're having blissful and beautiful experiences and imagining the most beautiful thing or the most pleasant thing or most... That's the type of karma that will more likely be projected into your next life. So then Tibetans have gone into this whole practice of training. Monks do this for like an hour a day, 20 minutes an hour a day. They practice death. At their at monasteries, right throughout, they practice death. But that makes so much sense. Why not just be bad and practice? <laughs> 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 because each karma you're planting is in your store. You can't turn around. It's like a lottery. Yeah, you don't know how you're going to die. We're imagining that we're going to be uh, happily in a in, in a room where people are going to you can die now, and uh, we'll come and see you in 20 minutes. Okay? Because it's not going to happen. That way. You know, it's not going to happen that way. You die between places. You die between walking out the door and getting to downstairs. In between places you die. You die between going to sleep and waking up in the morning. You don't wake up in the morning. You die between, I'm just going to go to the toilet and have a poop. And then you die. I'm going to have my bowl of cereal and the spoon's coming to my mouth and I drop the spoon. We don't die in a planned way. We don't know when we die. No one knows. You cannot know. So in that sense, it's like a uh, bad roulette to, <laughs> to, to leave it off till the last minute. And there is a, a, there's a thing called power, you know, where you do a special practice and go, right, I'm going to be right, ah, let's get drunk, let's do you know, let's Allow the mind to be the monkey in the hope that at the most stressful time of your entire life, when you can't move your bloody fingers, <laughs> You don't know what's happening to you. Your, your friends and family are looking at you with that face of, oh my God. And they're crying and you can't figure it out. And you're still in denial. At that most stressful time, you're not going, you're likely not to be going to go, okay, now I'm going to think, peace. Being serious. <laughs> Seriously, you know? Or have correct view. None of this comes from its own side. Yeah? Now, I, uh, you said the magic word before, and you just said it too. This thing has to have ignorance. Link 8 and 9, charge it up, but it must also have ignorance. Yeah? Ignorance of what? Self-existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Not understanding. Not understanding. The yelling boss. Yeah? Now, you have to habituate yourself to see that. Let me just make sure I've covered most of these things. I promised you that we'll talk about hmm? the bardo. Yeah. Okay, a quick thing about the bardo. So we've transitioned, right? We've transitioned from that last moment of death. One karma, just one, I don't know if I've driven that home enough, is going to determine the outline of what type of being you're going to be, the continuum of who you are. The others are going to fill in the detail. Um, it's the in-between stage, between births. Uh, you don't have a physical body, you're just consciousness. This is a lovely painting. I don't know if you can see in the detail. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but essentially... Huh? Sorry? Essentially... <laughs> no, he's one of them. Essentially, uh, it, it's saying... Uh, there's some white deeds, some white karmas, some positive karmas that you've done, some goodnesses that are in that bag of seeds, and then some darknesses, some blacknesses that are in that bag of seeds. And if you're lucky enough to get one of these ones, you're going to have a bunch of hallucinations that happen. Let me see if I can tell you. Okay. Let's talk about uh, death for a bit. I'll just summarize it because of time. Um, as the body is going, it's trying to figure out what the hell's happening. The mind is trying to figure out what the hell is happening. So it's important to be very quiet, not to be very jolted. 
not to disturb the state of mind. So, so you can, I guess, beat the odds to more positive karmas being available for that PJQ lane. If you're used to having mantras or, or holy things, have them being said around that person. If they're Christian, have some um, beautiful Christian text being heard. If whatever gives them pleasure. I mean, I all I could do for my dad uh, last year, I, and I was with him towards this time, he was very distressed, and he stopped believing in God and, and anyone. All I could do was uh, play with his triggers for happiness, which was being loved by his children, having done the right thing for taking us to Australia, uh, having been intelligent and clever and funny, yeah, um, having a following of people he wanted to have. He had all these women that he touched up. And he, you know, he, he was a crazy dude. He was amazing. But he was um, self-indulgent in so many ways, yeah? But allowing him to enjoy that he did goodnesses with all the people that he touched, that he did amazing things, that we truly loved him. Uh, I could see the breathing change. So it's it's important to not have um, disruptions. It's important to just get their state of mind in a place where you know from their side, from their habituations, they're going to be in a, in a place that is more conducive to a better rebirth. The other thing they say is don't um, don't touch the body for four to five hours because in the bardo, as the mind starts peeling away, if you like, they can still see you and hear you, but they're confused. The mind's confused. They don't understand why you're crying over that body. They don't. They can't figure it out for a couple of hours. So they start. They keep returning. The mind, keep, the consciousness keeps returning or trying to return to this place where the body was, the attachment to the body. Yeah. They say not to touch it. Because when you touch it and there's still some kind of connection to the body, the consciousness will be jolted there. So if you do touch it after a few hours, touch the heart first. Touch this part of the heart first. That's where you want. Um, if you're going to interfere. Uh, any kind of sensation, any kind of sensation that you have gets amplified many, many times because the mind is so arrested. So, if it's very cold, if the body gets very cold and the mind starts sensing, sensing that coldness as the coldness comes, it will want heat. And if it wants heat, it gets amplified. And if at that point, it jumps from the hallucinations to the next life or through to the bardo, their body, it's more likely that it will take a hell being realm or a hot hell realm as to satisfy that desire yeah, that comes. So it's extremely important to be very careful around uh, the body as it disintegrates, as consciousness disintegrates. What? They, uh, um, what's the effect of medication? Of medication? Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't know. All I can assume is that uh, if it dulls the mind, it will send it to that dullness point first. Like if you're talking about, uh, what's that drug called? The morphine. The morphine. If you're talking about morphine, I mean, you've seen the effect of that. You know, what you're trying to do is at the moment where you no longer have control over the thoughts, when you no longer are going with a, with that body's no longer going, I think I, I feel something, I can sense something, whatever, and then it starts getting lost in this habituation, in these hallucinations, which are either positive in nature or negative in nature. Yeah? So you will get an experience of blissful entities or horrible apparitions. What are they doing? I mean, are they really horrible apparitions? Are they really beautiful entities? No, it's the same as here. So you haven't got a body. They're just projections coming up, coming up. It's like the hand going into the bag of karma, getting ready to pick one. 
yeah? yeah? If you have the power, it, from my limited understanding of that, is if you have the correct view at that point, you can say, I know they're not coming from their own side. Yeah, and that's why in some wheel of lives, you will see a string coming out from the top there, all the way up to the moon. So at that point, some people can exit. That's why you'll see some wheel of life. So if you look for them, you'll notice it'll be like a tiny, like a rainbow trail, but there's tiny, tiny amount of people going that way. Yeah? You think of the amount of karma. If everything you experience here is neutral or pleasure, imagine the karma required to sustain this existence. How many karmas we're burning up to have breath. You know, to have a, the idea that we can navigate our environment. I mean, we're burning up karma like there's no tomorrow to have this amazing existence. Just forget the other realms. Look at the rest of the world. The 6.9 billion people living in India and China and South America and Central America. How do you compare to them? Who can spontaneously walk out on the street and say, I want some food? Cook me pizza. Pizza. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I want a drink. I feel like a hot beverage. Hot beverage. How, how many people can do that? I mean, if you've traveled at all, you know it's rare. It's extremely rare. So we're using up pirates, and hopefully we're planting some good ones along the way. Um, you can get up to seven bodies in the bardo, and the shape of your body there tends to, it's not your body, it's like a light thing. Uh, the shape of the bardo body tends to indicate the realm you're going to. But you, they only have a lifespan, I guess, of seven days. So day one on the, moment, on the time of death is important, to do and say the right thing around the body. Day seven is important to do and say the right things around the body or the location where the body died. And day 49, seven times seven, yeah? Just in case, you can't tell when they've reincarnated or not. Or well, reincarnated means what? Have the perception to see themselves alive again? Have the shifted perception to see themselves from not dead to dead. Yeah? Shift in perception. But it's not stuffed through the dog's bum. Yeah? Finally, I said it. <laughs> 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 I, could you just clarify the uh, day 49? Yeah, it's 7 times 7. So the maximum Vardo lives uh -huh. you could have is uh -huh. 7. Uh -huh. Yeah? Uh -huh. And the longest days you could have is se seven. 7. So 7 times okay. 7. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then there's this belief. I, I know that when I first entered Buddhism, I thought that somebody can guide you through this death process. Can someone guide you through the death process? Why not? It's your perception. That's it's a good answer, but well, what's more proof of why nobody can guide anybody through the death process? Because the whole universe disintegrates when you die. Well, if that were possible, we wouldn't be here. I mean, you know, like, if other beings could help us in the death process, there'd be no suffering beings, you know, like, okay, we'll get you, everyone will be human. But you can see beyond your own perception. Sorry? That's, yeah, yeah, it's similar. It's like you, you can see your own spectrum. And can you can you see into my thoughts? Can you think what I'm thinking? Can you, even if I try, there's no connecting. There's only your own perception. Yeah? But can you, I mean, I've heard this this practice of what you're, to, throughout our, our process, when we're doing a spiritual practice, you're developing an inner llama. So maybe at the point of death, you would have, you can have a, a really strong system. inner llama that you knew was coming from you, but that was like the highest part of yourself that you can maybe put your down. Which you, but it's no one outside right. that can help you. Uh, I have a question. I think it was this answer. That the many meditations that I'm combining with the Buddhism on how to guide the process, you, you review it in your meditation, and then when you find out, I've done that before, you know, so when you get it in your death, you can go to like, you know, like, like your realm, like mine, or Dhammakarta, and, you know, go 
question that is considered one day solution. Yeah, which I said, some some places it's not practice. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. 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 The, the other thing, thank you. The, the other thing is, uh, I guess as Michael said, just practice going to bed. When you go to sleep, you know, if, you, if you're not being taught those meditations, when you go to sleep, try and as you're drifting off to that sleep sense from being conscious to falling asleep, try and generate a sense, try and build a habit, try and build a karma of getting to a point where you start thinking of all the most, the greatest virtues from the day or from your life or whatever. So then you begin a habit of shifting from consciousness to not consciousness and that sense comes up. Yeah? That sense comes up. Um, I'll leave it there. I had something else to tell you. We'll try it tomorrow. It's, um, sorry, next week, next Wednesday. Can, can I take you 10 minutes? No? Sure or not? Yeah. You can go if you need to. Okay. One of the things to diffuse in 10, yeah? And there's practices, there's many things. There's, there's a few activities you could you could do, but one one activity to diffuse link ten, which we said ha needs to have ignorance to to be ignited, right? To be turned on, to be triggered, for the atomic bomb to actually be triggered, it needs ignorance. Yeah, has to do with this idea of me. Yeah, has to do with this idea of me as self-existent being, as me sitting here. And conventionally, we think of me as having this boundary, right? Having this me, this is Hector, right? So, somehow, if this was ice cream, as soon as it passed that boundary, it became yummy for Hector and Hector felt happy, yeah? So once things pass that boundary, uh, I, that me is happy, yeah? Because where is me? It's somewhere in this boundary, right? Equally, if you get a pin or a needle and you stab this boundary, you cross that boundary, me goes out. Yeah? But if you do the table, it doesn't go up. So it's not there. It's not there. It's somehow in this boundary, we, we experience it that way, right? So we also know that no bad can come from good and no good can come from bad. A reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. The law of karma says that I would never have had a beautiful experience of drinking the ice cream. Drinking the ice cream. That pleasure could only ever have come from me having given ice creamness to someone else. Yeah? Having offered some goodness. Done a good record. My mind recorder watching myself giving something has caused the karma to experience this empty object as pleasure or this empty object as pain, yeah? But we have this idea of me as here, right? So we know that it needs to pass this boundary for that me to be satisfied. A way to diffuse the thing or a way of thinking about it, and I cook this up, yeah? Is if the karma thing is true, and this boundary thing is true. For me to experience any pleasure, I must have given something to someone, right? But it needs to be passing this boundary, which is me. This is me. Hmm. Understanding karma means that I must have given Jamie the ice cream. So the ice cream has had to go past those lips over there, or those lips over there, or those lips over there, before I could ever have an experience of sweetness. Do you follow? So where is me? in this boundary anymore. If this is true, and we know that emptiness of the thing is true, 
and I have pleasure. I, the I has a sense of pleasure. It crossed that boundary for it to have an effect here. In that sense, the separation between you and me is non-existent. It's an illusion. It's fake. It's what causes the problem. It's what this idea of separation, if you trace it back, desiring or not liking, feeling and sensing and the rest, this idea of separation is the ignorance. This idea of me that that it crosses this boundary only and I'm happy. But it must cross that boundary before I can ever get any happiness or pain. So it's not like you are like me or I am like you and you should treat me nice like a good house guest. I am you. When you're feeding the guest at home, you're feeding you, really. Not someone like you, not some idea of you. Think about that logic. Where is the boundary of you, really, when you investigate things deeply? That re removes the fuse of the page and Jake and Eddie. That separates the red and black wire, or whatever it is, and then it's just immature karma sitting around without a fuse. It's like an armor walking around. Understanding that can diffuse the problem. Yeah. <coughs> Is that 